This is the September edition of the virtual layout tours presented by the 4th Division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association. Today we are joined by Steve Rohde from Nebraska. So what I put together today is, is some historical and personal context for the, for the railroad. Uh, there was an earlier version in a smaller house, um, so I, I want to give that uh, first, kind of show where the second layout came from. Uh, as mentioned, uh, considerations for design, construction, scenery, etc. Uh, and then I put together a layout tour for a train to go from basically from uh, Minneapolis staging to Denver staging. You'll see that in a second. So it gives you a chance to see the whole the whole layout. Uh, and then I've got a couple of slides on hindsight is 2020 to to pass along. Uh, it's been a it's been a challenging uh, what 20 years at this, um, and I've been modeling since I was three or four years old, as as most of us have too. So uh, so it is prototype freelance for the most part. I'm trying to combine my personal interests and history as well. So I'm trying to be as accurate as possible where I can be. Uh, so again, fall of 55, uh, NP and, and uh, Rio Grande were still using steam at that point. Um, so I wanted to be sure to include steam. Um, I've also got portions of the Milwaukee that you'll see. Uh, one of these days, I hope to get some catenary up. Uh, the UP West Yellowstone branch is included. Uh, I grew up in Colorado. Uh, my wife is from Albuquerque. So at one point on the old layout, she said, so where's the narrow gauge? So I figured out how to weave some of that in, and that has its actually its own room at this point in the in the new basement. So the Henry's Four Central is a city area of the NP. Um, and at this point, we have about a crew of 18. I anticipate 20 once we get the narrow gauge up and going. Uh, so again, I, it should all become pretty clear as, as we go through. I'll talk a little bit about some of the paperwork and the, and the operations as well. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Pretty good? Okay, thanks. So I've had this painting since the early 70s. Uh, I don't remember who, who purchased it for me. That would have been high school for me, but it was a real inspiration, uh, Z6, uh, somewhere in Montana in the, in the wintertime. So, so this, this, this desire to model the MP goes back a, a long ways, it, regardless of how much, as you'll see, the, the in, impetus was to also want to uh, model the Rio Grande after having grown up in Colorado. Uh, spent a lot of summers up in Montana and Idaho camping and fishing. Um, I'm a retired faculty member from the University of Nebraska. So uh, my background is in forest management and also in landscape architecture. So I'm a licensed landscape architect. Uh, and we would do three or four weeks at a time with a trailer up there. Uh, quickly fell in love with the Clark Fork and the Bitterroot and all the other rivers up there. And obviously can't, uh, had a lot of, uh, of uh, rail link, uh, rail fanning to do uh, as well as, uh, as the fishing went. Um, this was pretty typical. Back at that point, you string as many old locomotives as you can together and hope to get up Bozeman Hill, Bozeman Pass. So there, there was a lot to see up there and again, a lot of inspiration for wanting to model this part of the, the country. Uh, this is Mullen Pass um, and uh, again, the mid-train helpers. So uh, that was what I wanted to model. Uh, again, the Milwaukee, Milwaukee uh, parallels the NP several miles south uh, of Whitehall, Montana, a little town was called Piedmont. Uh, so it made sense for me to want to include some of the Milwaukee as well. Um, and the fall of 55 was the last point where they had the orange and maroon versus going to the, to the armor yellow. So that was another reason to want to, to use this particular time frame. Uh, down here in the lower right, uh, the Jefferson River Canyon, I am actually modeling that on the layout, as you'll see. So we've got the Milwaukee paralleling the, the MP through the, through the canyon. Uh, this is Tennessee Pass when it was still in operation. So again, growing up in Colorado, going to Glenwood Springs to the pool, et cetera. The mid-train helpers, the 3%, all of that was something that I was really interested in wanting to model. So I had to come up with a, 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 some way to be able to combine all of this as part of a, of a basement uh, layout. Uh, this is tunnel number one, just west of Denver uh, with the Zephyr. And it, in high school, college, literally, we would walk this grade uh, and then climb up on the mountain, sit right about here where my cursor is and watch the, the Mars lights coming out of Arvada. So, so a lot of this, again, I needed to come up with some, some way to combine the Rio Grande with, with all of this other uh, railroading up in the, the Intermountain region of the US. And then again, the narrow gauge was something that I also wanted to combine. I worked for the Forest Service one summer in graduate school uh, on the Rio Grande National Forest. So I had a chance to go over to the Chama Basin uh, and I would make the drive over and watch the trains come up Coombrees Pass every Saturday morning in the summer. So 
there was a lot to work with there as well. So this was version one, uh, design built, operated 2000 to 2017. It was a 700 square foot basement, a fairly small house in Midtown Omaha. Uh, operated for five OS Omaha events, which is our every other year operating weekend. And then we did host ProRail in 2011. Uh, I was very lucky. It was not initially designed for operations. Uh, we got that changed pretty quick with the operating group in Omaha, but it was my first, first uh, exposure to what operations were. And it, it changed everything in terms of the, 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 the socializing and the hobby, as well as the challenge of trying to emulate history, so to speak, with a, with a railroad. So the dark black line here is, is really what I was modeling from Whitehall. I-90 goes through up some, most of you are probably familiar with the I-90 corridor. And so this was uh, actually the Alder River branch or the, the Valley branch came down maybe to about here. So this extended over the Continental Divide and then on down through uh, Southwestern Wyoming and then would ultimately connect with Craig on the, on the branch with the Rio Grande to allow that connection to Rio Grande. Uh, the thought being that Rio Grande would then have the ability to get up here and interchange with the Milwaukee Road. So uh, again, a little bit far-fetched, but that's, that's what we've got to try to include everything. The West Yellowstone branch was existing here up from Pocatello and then the Henry's Fork Central again is the narrow gauge that adds in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the branch for the narrow gauge. So this was the original layout. Uh, I hand painted the backdrops. A lot of this rock work is the Bragdon uh, uh, plastic um, through the, the, the big uh, molds. Um, it worked well. We had a crew of 10 or 11. Um, it got a little tight in some of the aisles here. Again, it was a relatively small basement, but it, this was a narrow gauge up here going up to a mine. So it included a lot of the things that, that again, I have, have wanted to, to, uh, to keep track of and, and make sure that it somehow it, it fit back into the new, the new basement. Um, so um, a lot of, again, articulated still at the end of steam. This was actually 1958. So it was a little bit of a stretch for the steam, but you can kind of get the flavor of what the old layout actually looked like. Uh, again, the socializing is huge in this hobby. It was a lot of fun, had a, had a really committed crew. Uh, we had a 50th uh, birthday or birthday, 50th party for, for uh, sessions. I think we got to session 59 on this layout before we, uh, before we tore it down. Uh, this was a painful Saturday morning Sawzall party. Uh, at some point, this stuff has to happen. So uh, even had some good help in getting this all pulled out and putting it out on the driveway for uh, for salvage pickup. So I think a lot of us have been through it. It's not easy, but it uh, it definitely opens up the mind for the next next iteration. So this is version two. Uh, we've moved into the house in in October. Started design in in, in November of 2017. 2,000 square foot basement this time. I'm not sure you're supposed to upsize in retirement on your housing. But if, if you want a ranch style house with a big basement, why that's what you do. So, uh, and my wife uh, been on board from, from day one. So that's, that's a huge, uh, huge benefit as well. Uh, we did operate uh, for a couple of OS Omaha's at this point, just getting started. Um, we had a lot of design sessions downstairs. I took a lot of feedback. Um, as a, as a, I guess as a design professional, uh, I've always seen the benefit of group thought and process and design. And so uh, you can't use it all. You've got to be strategic in, in what you do use in terms of feedback. But it was it was a huge help, I think, to get a lot of good ideas. Dave Hunt, a colleague here in uh, Omaha, documented a lot of the initial ideas in a, in a CAD program for me. And then, as you'll see here in a second, I did a lot of uh, changing around to get things to fit. But this first cut in the, in the basement was certainly really important. Um, version 2 addition basically expanded the area here at Whitehall. So on the old layout, it went into staging here. And now we've got Whitehall model, we've got Piedmont model, and then the section, here's the Jefferson River Canyon as well. So that was that was really the, the, the part that added to the 2000 square feet in terms of the, in terms of the basement at this point. Um, so uh, we added the Red Bluff branch over here at the east end at Sappington. And then again, we've got a 3% ruling grade eastbound, uh, Piedmont to Summit and 2.5% on the other side. So the other layout had a grade up to staging. So now we've got grade on either side of a, of a mountain pass up to up to basically summit here, which is the Idaho Montana state line. Um, so I, I converted those drawings, I, I upsized them uh, and then it converted everything to one inch to the foot so that those the crew that was helping me in terms of the carpentry and the bench work had something they could actually scale from. It was a lot of extra work. This is all freehand. Uh, scaled with a with a ruler, but it gave us something to really lay out and be able to to work from. 
Um, and I'll mention this a couple times, but I did everything myself on the old layout. Uh, I'm a real perfectionist. I like the design part. I like the scenery. So the idea of sharing all of that with people, it, it's really been a challenge. It was a stretch for me. Uh, I've, I've found, obviously, there's a huge amount of benefits to it, but um, oftentimes you feel more like a like a, a construction manager and a critical path manager on a Saturday morning than you do an actual modeler because it's all about making sure everybody else has something to do and being able to monitor and make sure it's getting done in, a, in an effective way. Uh, these are half inch to the foot drawings, a little bit hard to see on the industries, but I just wanted to give kind of an overview of the of the basement. So this is the lower level. Uh, the red is the uh, Northern Pacific. So Seattle staging comes through Whitehall. This is the Whitehall Y, goes through Whitehall and then ultimately ends up over here in, in Minneapolis staging. Um, the, the orange is the Milwaukee Road. So it, it in essence starts out at Tacoma, it comes in over here in, uh, in Milwaukee, Minneapolis. Um, this is the overlap right here with the MNCS. Uh, this is the Jefferson River Canyon right here, uh, where they where they parallel. So uh, again, very fictitious. Whitehall wasn't near this size of place uh, in reality, but it's the major yard here on the on the layout. This is the second level. So uh, this is basically the the uh, Soda Springs branch is on the on the, on the second level. Um, let's see, the yellow now is the UP. So this is Idaho Falls staging. Uh, shared trackage coming through Mineral Springs. And then uh, uh, on the third level, you'll see it ends up in uh, West Yellowstone. This is Denver staging. We've got two pieces of that. So it comes out of Blackfoot, winds its way around through Mineral Springs and then up the grade to uh, to the summit. So it's basically the shape of the T as you saw on the, uh, on the maps. And then this is the top portion. So here's West Yellowstone here. We've got a, a Y at summit to turn the articulated helper engines. Uh, and then this is just the very last piece that comes up here at, uh, at Summit with the, uh, the siding. Over. Here's the station right here. So, so important considerations overall. Um, I, I'm 67 at this point. I'd like to operate as long as possible. We have, I've seen, I've been on a lot of layouts that had staging really tucked away, maybe 20 inches off the floor. Um, we had initially thought to do that along that peninsula in the basement, and also we're gonna put a big helix in. I'm glad we didn't. Uh, the staging, as you'll see through the pictures, is, is, uh, is easy to get to, um, and that's gonna be a, a big thing, I think, over time. Uh, we have return loops on all the staging, so we don't have any dead end staging. That helps with staging uh, significantly in terms of time. Uh, tried to minimize gates. Uh, we've got a couple of knot unders, but they're up at 60 plus inches, so they're not too bad. Uh, there is a, there are a couple of access hatches. Try to minimize those. Make sure that people take those jobs. Know they're going to have to uh, have to do a little bit of crawling under to, to get to a certain area of the layout. Um, try to keep the aisles as wide as possible. A uh, couple of pinch points, but at least three feet. Otherwise, it seems like we're all getting wider and wider. So I think the aisles need to get wider and wider as well. Um, try to minimize uh, places where operators work back to back. So wherever yards were, I tried to offset where most people would be standing to avoid some conflict there. Uh, lighting, I've been on some amazing, beautiful layouts that, that just weren't lit well. And it was really hard to appreciate the, 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 the quality in the, in the modeling. So I was adamant to try to do my best with the lighting. Um, turned out we had four 20 amp circuits left in the house. And so at this point, what I did was have an electrician put those separate with a, uh, an off on switch so I can turn the whole basement off. Uh, and then we're using 12 gauge extension cords rather than rewiring the basement. And I, I, it's worked well, uh, keep these up into the bench work. And that it seems to be a safe way to be able to, in essence, turn the basement off with, uh, with one switch. Um, crew lounge, uh, have that available. Uh, and then the reachability on upper levels, we've got, we've got a couple of places. We had at one point debated some some uh, some flooring elevated for a yard. I think at this point, we're not gonna do it. We've tried it long enough and people seem to be able to reach just fine. So operations, again, 55, still have steam. Uh, and even with the helpers, uh, I mentioned the Milwaukee still in maroon and orange. Uh, fall of 55, uh, fall is a good year. I had my modeled summer prior, uh, prior so there's all kinds of livestock fruit. Uh, I like to model sugar beets with aniseed. Uh, so there's a lot of that, the potatoes in Idaho, uh, fictitiously probably, but last peaches from Colorado coming up from Bond and going west. So that gives us some reefers out of, out of Denver. Uh, 
We've got the MP, as I mentioned, the MNCS, uh, which is kind of the focus. Um, the Rio Grande is included, and the reason it has is because it interchanges with the Milwaukee. Um, dual gauge, narrow gauge, uh, again, was woven through the old layout. It has its own room this time, and we'll do some, some um, transloading dual gauge, similar, I suppose, to what Salida had. Uh, Pat Student has a lot of input on this, given he's modeling Marshall Pass, so, uh, so I'm anxious to, to, to get that modeled. Uh, UP is in there. And then again, the mountain grades and uh, sound is is amazing nowadays. It's uh, it's almost as fun to watch the diesels come down in dynamic as, as it is to watch the the trains go up with the helpers. So any any questions at this point? Pretty good. Okay. Uh, so this was the start. Um, we weren't quite sure about about uh, heights in terms of bench work visibility. Uh, there's been a lot written about it, but I think until you actually mock something up and kind of decide based on your own viewpoint, what's going to work, what you can reach, et cetera. Uh, this was really helpful to be able to do this. And then we actually built this again, Pat student said, we need to get started. He said, I'll bring over the stuff. And he came basically with a truck full of, of, of lumber that had been pre-cut to, to build this test track. So that's kind of got how things started. Um, so I, we had an oval here to test things. I was finally dipping my toe in the brass locomotive uh scenario in life and i wanted to be able to try them as i bought them uh, and then we had this three percent grade also uh model because what i wanted to be able to do was see how all these locomotives were going to do on that grade and it wasn't only uh what you could pull up the grade but it was also this downhill hesitation a lot of times the uh the gearing in even some of the diesels uh, is loose enough that you get a lot of bucking so i wanted to really see how everything was going to work together some of the brass is exceptional. Some of it looks a lot better than it pulls. So I just, I wanted to get a good idea of that in terms of, of what those grades would look like, what would be a realistic train length. Uh, turns out uh, for me that the Genesis uh, Z8s uh, are extraordinary. And uh, so again, uh, and they look good too. So but you can kind of see the, the variety of how well different, different locomotives uh, did. Uh, so again, here's that test track, here's the 3%. Uh, so we had a 36 inch radius curve and then 3% to check all the, all the uh, uh, logistics of, of the, uh, the grade. 25 car length, uh, caboose, four F units, uh, and then including the articulated. So it makes for some pretty long arrival departure tracks, <clears throat> excuse me, in the uh, yards, uh, Mineral Springs and uh, Whitehall and, and some, some long sightings on the, on the pass as well. But that was ultimately what we were trying to, uh, to design for. Um, Few details: 36-inch uh, radius uh, minimum uh, on the on the main line, 24-inch branch line in the narrow gauge. Uh, I used a lot of different curve uh, uh, turnouts, uh, different numbers, but also different brands. Uh, I haven't had any problem with that. I'm glad I had the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, staging went to Atlas, uh, Atlas and Pico turnouts. Uh, 600 feet of main line. Uh, I've got a lens system that I bought at Caboose Hobbies way back when. Uh, they're really not supported anymore. It's, it's a bulletproof system. So I made the commitment to go ahead and get the CVP wireless throttles that go with a, a receiver that works with lens. So it's kind of a hybrid system. Uh, it's worked great. Uh, got corded throttles in the yards. Um, so we'll see how that, how that goes over time. I, it, it, it works really well at this point. Uh, we got four boosters. Uh, I use the PSX circuit breakers and reversers. I have put the lights out in the in the aisles, as you can see here on the diagram, just to help troubleshoot where somebody might have gone through something or, or derailment. Uh, so a, a lot of, again, a lot of the basic uh, what infrastructure that we all tend to use on our, uh, on our layouts. Uh, bench work, uh, and this, this is kind of the complicated place in the basement where we've got the, the white, Paul Y underneath, uh, basically Denver staging, the Soda Springs branch, and this is the 3% grade going up, and then this is uh, Summit. So most, most often lower le levels, 36 to 40 inches. Uh, we did raise Whitehall four inches from the Y here because it just seemed like it was a better, uh, better height to work at uh, for, a, for a session. Uh, upper levels were at about 54 inches. Uh, Summit up here is at 69, so there is a step up there to be able to see what you're doing up there at summit. But the, the 54 inches seems to be okay for people to reach across 
uh, for, for 20, 24 inches. Uh, and uh, we didn't need that, that uh, elevated flooring that we thought we might for that part of the, part of the basement. Uh, one by four framing attached to the walls with shelf brackets. You'll see some more of that here in just a second. Uh, the peninsula, I'll also show you graphically. It's kind of hard to explain, but with the idea of, of setting this peninsula up for the full basement, we wanted it really rigid, but we also needed a lot of flexibility in terms of the grade going up with the uh, support. So I'll show you that here in a second with the, with the pictures. Uh, but again, this was Pat's idea to come up with the uh, one by four sandwiched with the, with the half inch plywood. It's worked really well. Uh, we used the two inch homosote spline for the main line for, throughout most of the basement and then the three quarter plywood for, for, for flat areas. Um, Je Jeff Otto has had a huge influence on modeling here in Omaha. Uh, he and Pat go back a long time at UP. So we got a lot of feedback from Jeff on, on spline. It, he's used a lot of it. It's been, he's been very successful with it. So uh, as you'll see, I'm really happy with the way it's worked here in, in, uh, on this layout. Uh, staging capacity. Uh, 10 in Minneapolis, uh, Milwaukee, uh, 10 in Seattle, Tacoma, and then Denver, we've got 18. My initial thought was I would need more staging at the bottom of the T shape. Uh, turns out that with the through trains from Minneapolis to Seattle, like the North Coast Limited, you, it, it probably would have been better in hindsight to have had a more equitable staging between all three endpoints. But as it is, it, it seems to work pretty well. So this is Pat's student. Again, he was up in Seattle here for the Narrow Gauge Convention uh, uh, not that, just recently. Uh, been a huge help. He's done a lot of the, the framing, a lot of the carpentry and bench work. As you'll see, I want to acknowledge a bunch of other folks as well who have who've, uh, really helped out with, uh, with construction. We're only about four years into this, so we've made a lot of progress in the time we've had. And we've uh, we masked up when necessary. But we pretty much had a work session every Wednesday night and every Saturday morning for the last four years. So it's, that's, that's how you make progress in a basement this size. So this, again, this was the beginning, uh, getting the spline, getting the spline started. Uh, kind of daunting each time I look down this basement to see this big open room and wonder what we were gonna do with it, Get, especially given the old basement was a fourth of the size, but we, uh, we just, we tackled it a piece at a time. Um, and I was adamant to have those scaled drawings done ahead of time. So. I think oftentimes you'll, modelers will say, well, I just, I just kind of designed as I went. Uh, I would fully admit that some of this is uh, uh, construction first, and then you come back and tweak the design. But for the most part, I really wanted to make sure everything fit uh, and everything worked. Uh, Rosie showed up at some point, so she was a big help, obviously. Uh, we had a fireplace in the basement uh, that is getting covered over here. I decided I didn't want to have the crew sitting around at the fireplace when they should be running trains. So we, we covered that over. And, uh, uh, the previous owners of the house used to actually have quite church choir practice down here in this basement as big as it was. So they came back to see the house and I wish I had pictures of the looks on their face when they turned the corner here and looked at the basement to see what their choir practice room had uh, turned into. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, here's Pat working on the spline up on the upper level. This, again, got pretty, it was an interesting process to come up with the spline in terms of the 3D, making sure the grade was consistent. Uh, last thing you want is a piece of 4% in the middle of 3% because then that's your ruling grade. So there was a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of finessing and a lot of detail work. Again, I turned, I end up being a real perfectionist at times, but it was really necessary, I think, to get this grade uh, to work right. Um, and to be able to kind of build it in midair, so to speak. Um, this is a cross section. So on that peninsula, again, we're talking about the peninsula that goes down the other end of the room. Um, I drew all of this up at that same scale, but I layered the tracing paper so that I knew I had a, a, a version of all of the stuff going on vertically. And then every 32 inches is what is what you need for support for that spline. I went ahead and drew a cross section based on, you can see the little bit of the, the uh, uh, colors up here for the upper level, lower level, because each one of these supports that I've drawn is, is different based on where it has to support the grade growing up and down the, the hill and where the, where the branch line was going to be. So uh, this worked out really well because again, then th these were scalable so that Pat could take the measurements and then be able to put together the support. So here's the supports. Again, you'll notice that the, 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 uh, the notch for the grade changes as it goes up the hill, but on the other side, it stays the same. Um, I think we had 20, 22 of these sections. So we labeled them with, uh, with the alphabet, each one different. 
Uh, so it was a labor of love to put this together, but again, it seems to have worked really well. We've got a nice consistent grade going up the hill and it's very, very solid and sturdy on, on the L girders down the middle of the, the basement. Um, continued work, this is Charlie Duckworth, uh, Ralph Shearing and, and Dick Riker, all, all former UP. Uh, Charlie is very well known for, for a lot of the modeling that he does on, in, in Missouri on an old branch. Uh, but again, it was really nice to get the kind of help that was available and willing to uh, to get things started. All flex track, so not a lot. All these guys, I think, are capable of handling. But we had flex track here in the basement. This is the end of the peninsula on the on the west end of the basement. This is what becomes the Soda Springs area that you'll see in the in the pictures here in just a second. Um, again, with the spline, the ability to curve this spline and and have the the automatic spiral transitions. And the flow that you get, I'm, I'm not sure you could really do it any other way. To 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 cut pieces of plywood, um, it just it, I don't think it would have been impractical to try to get that that uh, that spiral transition. So uh, everything's super elevated as well with some uh, little thin strips of masking tape. But um, as far as I'm concerned, this blind has, has really worked well. Uh, this is the top of the grade uh, around in the bend up at summit uh, just prior. Uh, this backdrop was actually taken out of gate five at the Bozeman airport. And so it was kind of a fluke. I was getting on the plane and I thought, uh, well, beautiful view, the sun's out, I'm heading back to Omaha. Turned out it's, it's kind of, it's the backdrop now for the, the, probably the most visible part of the basement where you first walk in. So one of the lessons, I guess, on the backdrops that I'll mention here in a second is you're never quite sure what's going to work, but go ahead and take the pictures because it, in spite of everything, it might actually be a, a key part of what you want to use. This is an overview looking west of the basement. So I'm basically standing up at uh, at kind of the uh, what the east end or west end of Summit. Uh, the Y comes out here. Uh, this was just before we had the first OS Omaha. So really no scenery started. We didn't have the backdrops in at all. This was temporary staging right here in essence for uh, uh, Minneapolis because we didn't have the main line coming back over here into the corner where that was. But kind of it gives you a sense of the overall uh, uh, layout of, of the basement. And uh, this is the two and a half percent grade coming up from uh, from Mineral Springs down here. Mineral Springs is a, it would be the yard down here at the end. Uh, this is Piedmont. So we've got an interchange track here. Uh, so th this is where the Rio Grande interchanges with the, the Milwaukee. Again, Piedmont was a had a siding, uh, not much to speak of for the Milwaukee. I've enlarged that a little bit so to allow us that overlap. Uh, the Rio Grande does have Agreements for service, locomotive servicing in the Whitehall. So everything proceeds over to uh, to the yard there for servicing. Uh, again, this is Denver staging, one part of it. Uh, and then this is the Seattle, Seattle staging down here at the bottom. Uh, this was our first session with OS Omaha. Uh, basically just running trains. I had had some some folks, including Jeff and, and others, who said they just could just kind of give it a Give it a whirl and see how it works. And uh, it was great, it was not a formal operating session, but uh, there's nothing like deadlines to make progress on a layout. I think we all know that. So there was some pretty, uh, pretty what? Ambitious deadlines set up to be able to get some of this work done. Uh, scenery, it, it, probably a favorite part of the hobby for me. Uh, part of it's because I, I am a designer. Uh, part of it, I just, I like to, like to fiddle with things. So, uh, I'm really anxious to get to more of that. You'll see the start of some of that in these pictures, but there's certainly gonna be a lot more to go. So um, the lighting, uh, we doubled 5,000 K light strips. Uh, and I was actually able to find some that are 32 feet long instead of 16 feet. Uh, and the, the, the transformer is a plug-in and it seems to, to do fine in terms of the current. They don't overheat. So it, it, it was a really an efficient way. It's amazing how the technology has changed even just the last several years for these. Um, but the angle helps push light back and then the, the, the 90 degrees pushes it straight down. Um, I've got some can lights in, as you'll see in some of the pictures, I used them in the old layout uh, where we don't have valence up. Uh, I think the key thing is the 5,000 K color temperature. It's high noon. Uh, it's not yellow like you'd have with more of the incandescent. There's always a lot of kind of the Ford versus Chevrolet discussions about which, which K value is the, is the best one for layout. Uh, but 5,000 is fairly common now. Uh, you can get the, the, the regular bulbs and the, and the spotlight type bulbs at 5,000 K. So everything's consistent for the whole basement. Um, 
scenery. Uh, I use a lot of rosin paper coated with Elmer's glue. I also use a lot of the plastic cloth where needed, uh, cardboard lattice where required. Uh, again, you'll see all that in some of the construction pictures. Uh, and then I'm, I'm a huge user of the plastic rock castings from Bragdon. Uh, I can't imagine some of the rock that I've done that would have to been plaster in terms of weight and, and other things. So very lightweight. And I'm reusing a lot of the molds I had previous uh, just by repainting them and, and using them over. So uh, uh, they'll, they'll all come in handy. Uh, we've got about 100 industry spots. Uh, and I, there is an NP inventory of industries for the whole railroad. I don't remember what year it is. It's, it's within a decade or two uh, of what I'm modeling. So it was, it was interesting to go out and see what was actually through those states and then try to emulate that as, as much as possible. So here's the here's some of the start of the scenery on the upper level. I wanted to get this mostly done because we needed to I, before we put in the Whitehall yard down here on the bottom. So you can see the, the cardboard strips. You can see the foam core we used as kind of a, a guardrail uh, on that foam core. I just I wasn't willing to run new brass articulated five feet off the ground uh, without some sort of a protection. So as those guardrails come off and the scenery goes in, then I've reused that for the for the, the ridge line, so to speak, for a lot of the uh, a lot of the scenery. So, um, and then so again, some of this gets coated. I use a lot of sculpta mold. This this is one of those molds. Uh, and the the beauty of this is that it is curvable if you heat it up with a hair dryer because it is plastic, uh, and they can really be fairly thin in terms of of how they're cast. So there's a lot of places where you can get some pretty tight fits in with the rock and still have uh, have uh, everything work fine with the uh, with the equipment. Uh, on the backdrops, uh, I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, I, I know a lot more about Photoshop than I ever did before. Uh, there are panoramas of Montana and Idaho landscapes. I, I tried to get the actual, some of the actual alignments, uh, if not relatively close. Uh, I took some of these in the summer of 2005 uh, and then I took some most of them were taken in October 2018. I had a conference to attend in Spokane. And after it was over, I rented a car and drove hundreds of miles through uh, Whitehall, down the Alder River Valley, et cetera, to, uh, or the Jefferson River Valley to take these pictures. Um, with that said, I, I also was out in Colorado uh, fishing in the fall in, in 2020. A lot of beautiful color west of Gunnison. Some of you might be familiar with Cerro Summit, uh, the narrow gauge route west of Gunnison. So some of these pictures, as you'll see, were included. Um, and I guess if somebody wants to nitpick me on having the east end of the Black Canyon of the Gunnison in my layout somewhere in Montana, Idaho, well, I guess we can talk about it. So it's a, it's a definitely a combination of all, all mountain scenery from the Intermountain region. Um, I use Photoshop. I merged the images into, into 50, typically 15 to 20 foot lengths, 12 inches to 24 inch heights. Um, I tried to blend the seams and I'll show you that in just a second between landscapes. Uh, some people will, will actually cut the entire sky out because it's so hard to get a panorama side to side, uh, especially with uh, the different colors of blue in the clouds. Uh, I really wanted to include the big sky part of these panoramas from Montana. So I went ahead and uh, did my best to, to make it as seamless as possible. And then they're printed on polypropylene plastic, which is banner material. Um, which makes them much easier to handle at that size than if you had them on bond paper. Uh, and then I'm installing them on trim coil, which is, which is thin aluminum. Uh, and I'm using extra stick masking tape. Uh, uh, let's see, who was it? I'm trying to remember. Uh, Mike Califone, I think it is. There's been modelers that have used that. Uh, Lance Minheim uh, swears by the trim coil in terms of a freestanding backdrop. Uh, at one point, I thought I might do some painting again and decided to go with the photos. So so er everything I've tried, a lot of this does come from other places. Uh, and so far, it's worked really well for me. Uh, and I did. Uh, I do have an article I was asked to do for backdrop planning that's supposed to be in the next MRP, the Model Railroad Planning Magazine uh, for 2023. So it explains a lot of the background on this. It was it was a lot of work to try to come up with some of the stuff, but again, I'm really happy with 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 the way it's come out. So um, this this picture was taken in 2005 here in the upper left. Uh, this was taken just north of Soda Springs. These are some of the phosphate mine tailings. So this is on on the Soda Springs branch that goes to Soda Springs. Uh, and I took it in the summer of 2005 
So it was bright green. So I fiddled in Photoshop to get it to look more like October instead of July. So even there, I was able to reuse some of these uh, backdrops to fit to fit together. Here's that east end of the Black Canyon, the Gunnison. Again, you can see the, the color from the Gamble Oak and the, the uh, Skunk Brush Sumac and, and all in Colorado and a lot of Aspen at upper elevations. Uh, this is part of the 3% grade that you'll see on the on the layout tour. Uh, most of the landscape up there is, is pretty much what in, is in the middle here. Uh, so I had a nice sunny day uh, to drive around. And then uh, Saturday, uh, the first snows of the fall uh, were happening in the mountains up above Missoula, east of Missoula. So uh, as you'll see in a second, the backdrops at Summit include this snowstorm. So I will have some modeled snow up there at the top. So I really got lucky in terms of being able to get the diversity of landscape backdrop, the seasons, uh, was the right time of year. Um, and so it, it's worked out well for me. Uh, on operations, again, we currently have crew of 18. Uh, we've put this together as a, as a, as a dispatch panel. We've got the, got the, the uh, dispatching sheets here scheduled. Uh, it's getting us by. Uh, we did inherit, I inherited a phone system uh, from folks down in uh, Arkansas that used to run the hog rail operations. If, if you know of anybody down there, Bob Moore and, and John McBee. Uh, so we've got that in now. Previously, we were using some radios, which also worked fine. So just at this point, just verbal authority. I have my heart set on a CTC panel. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of folks in Kansas City that have implemented CTC with, with the standard old panels. And I would like to be able to get that put in at some point. Um, ship it car card system, just, just the way bills, not, not all of the other, uh, detail for shipping. Uh, I'll show pictures here in just a second. Um, and then again, I'll kind of show you the training packs. I'm, I'm a stickler, I suppose, again, with that perfectionism for a lot of paperwork to help people really be empowered when they're operating. So, um, the color dot system was published at one point in, in, in model railroader. Uh, it's worked well for me in, ter in terms of, of uh, uh, not having to know whether Butte is east or west of Bozeman. Uh, a lot of branch line uh, uh, trains go out of some of these yards. Uh, this switching guide, blocking and switching, uh, each of the yard masters, the three yard masters get these. So they've got a lineup of kind of what to expect, uh, who's going to be in town, um, and then what you might get set out and, and what that train picks up by color code. It also mentions uh, caboose assignments, if there's a caboose swap. Uh, it mentions helpers, if there's a helper assigned or not. Uh, and then we do have wood frame and steel frame cabooses. So with the helper engine, depending on where it is, you may need a, a, a wood or caboose uh, steel frame. So all of that are on these sheets. As you can see, this one, every one of these gets marked up by the yard master in terms of, of what needs to be edited and revised too. So uh, definitely a, a, a work in progress. Uh, the packs, uh, again, caboose cards, uh, all, all is fairly typical, uh, but I, the basic instructions in the back of the pack, these are just the plastic uh, pocket protectors. Uh, most everything has sound, so I like to have the function key information right up front so you can use the sound uh, as best you can. Um, so again, overall, paperwork's a lot of work in our hobby, but I think that the more the better. Um, and then take a lot of feedback in terms of what works for people in terms of making, making sense out of it. Um, schedule, Milwaukee's orange, the UP's yellow, the Rio Grande is, is the silver gray, the blue are the pasture trains. So posting this helps people kind of understand what they're signing up for, and it helps keep the dispatcher uh, clued in on what's going on. So any, any questions at this point? If not, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take the, uh, the tour here. Um, so this is uh, an expedited train. Uh, uh, MP uh, the six, number six hundred was their was their uh, uh, most important eastbound train. So they typically the lower the six hundred number on the freight trains is more important. So I've tried to even borrow that kind of a numbering system in terms of uh, uh, passenger trains, high priority trains, branch trains, etc. So uh, this would hypothetically be a train that's leaving. Uh, Livingston for Denver. So we're now westbound on the NP main. This pink foam is the Jefferson River, which will come around here. We've got a, a Milwaukee, uh, some box cabs here on the Milwaukee on the other side of the river. Um, and I've got diagrams here that kind of show the dot on where the actual, uh, this location is based on the, on the map. 
Uh, so this is this is coming into Whitehall again eastbound. We've got a couple of arrival departure. We've got uh, classification. We'll have a six stall roundhouse at some point with engine facilities. Um, this is the upper level again, pretty well finished in terms of in terms of scenery. Uh, got a lot to do here on the uh, on the bottom, obviously. So this is the west end of Whitehall Yard. Um, uh, we I do have set out for a lot of express at all the passenger stations along the line. So that's another opportunity for crews to do some work. I've got a lot of uh, industry. Got a lot of industry in the yards so that yard crews who have time have more to do. Uh, so I think that's that's been helpful. If it doesn't get done, then I can rebuild some cars and, and, and call it good if they get too busy otherwise. This is the Whitehall Y. So the, the number on this train is it starts out odd since it's westbound, and then it does change to even as it leaves Whitehall because now we're basically timetable east going to uh, going to Denver. This is coming through Piedmont. We've got a, a Rio Grande train here picking up here on the interchange, and this is that same uh, Milwaukee, still still westbound, going through Piedmont on the way to uh, on the on the way to Tacoma. This is the start of the 3% grade right here. So this is looking down the aisle from where we just came from. Again, this is Piedmont. This is the Soda Springs branch. So this comes off the main at Blackfoot, comes around and then uh, comes all the way down. So there's a lot of switching that gets done. A UP local also comes out from staging from behind the backdrop and does some local switching behind. So it's basically a yard with an interchange of the MNCS and UP. Um, the more I've operated over the years, the more I understand how much people like to do switching. So I tried to incorporate a lot of switching on this uh, layout as well as mainline, mainline running. This is coming up to 3% on the other side. Uh, this, is the, this is again, part of Soda Springs. It incorporates the whole end of the peninsula. Um, still kind of sorting out where a station might go here. And instead of having the, uh, the uh, foam core up here, we're now going to the foam. So I, I'm, I have a, uh, a goal to try to, to get a lot of the scenery done on this 3% by OS Omaha, our next OS Omaha, which is, well, should be next summer if, if everything holds together. Uh, this bottom level is the, uh, is the Alder branch. This is Silver Sky. So this, this comes off the main here and uh, again, a lot more switching on the, on the lower level. Uh, getting started with some of that foam uh, here in terms of cut and fill for this grade. Uh, this, this backdrop again is all taken from uh, that Cerro Summit area west of Gunnison in, in Colorado. This is on up through, there'll be a tunnel here. I did have to, uh, at each of these cuts, I actually stair step the backdrop a little bit. Uh, otherwise I would have lost most of the backdrop behind the bench work because the grade went up. So that uh, prompts a need to come up a little higher. This is the end of the, the uh, backdrop right here. So we've got a, a tunnel in here. I've got a lake started here. Um, and this is, uh, again, all 3%, <clears throat> excuse me. This is the view you get when you come into the basement. So I wanted to be able to keep, so this whole view corridor will stay intact all the way across. This will be a big fill here. This is a fill. Uh, and then you'll be able to see the train all the way over here into the mountains uh, behind uh, Bozeman. This is Summit. Uh, so again, this is on the main. We got the siding and we've got the, the uh, Y to turn the helpers up here. Um, uh, there are some places where I can take the trim coil out, as you can see here, for access. So that was important. So uh, a lot of work to get the panoramas uh, done on the computer and printed and spliced. Uh, but again, I think it's uh, it was worthwhile. Uh, and you can see part of the snowstorm here at Summit, where again I will model some snow up here at the at the top. <clears throat> this is coming down to two and a half percent. Again, eastbound into Mineral Springs. Uh, the, the UP West Yellowstone staging is right up here behind this. So I will make these, uh, I'll have some lift out scenery. I can get to that. Uh, this is where the UP comes on to go through Mineral Springs over to, to Idaho Falls. Um, I've left the valence out up here now. So this is all temporary. The lighting is there, but you need all the headroom you can get up here in these spaces. So once we get the scenery done, we'll put a valence in here to look a lot better. This is Sage. So there's a siding right here at Sage before you get to Mineral Springs. Um, this is part of the return loop for the Denver staging. Um, and a lot of this has some lift outs that are only in during staging because I didn't want to have any of that in the way as part of operations. The Mil uh, Milwaukee, uh, Minneapolis staging is down here at the bottom level. <clears throat> and you can see how the foam core was used as a, 
kind of a guardrail. Again, all that's coming out. It looks much, much better once that comes out. So this is entering Mineral Springs. Um, again, we've got set outs for Express and for Pullman's. Um, helper facilities, uh, engine facilities here, similar to, uh, to uh, Whitehall. Uh, this was an experiment for me on actually inserting buildings into the backdrop. So these are printed as part of the backdrop, add some depth to the, uh, to the scenery. Um, this is leaving Mineral Springs. Some of the industries I was able to reuse, some I've purchased at the state sales. Got a long ways to go for the buildings. Uh, you can see where uh, the, uh, Jefferson River Canyon this is where we initially started the tour down here at, uh, at a siding called Canyon. This is Commerce City, uh, winding the bend. This is one of the access hatches I mentioned before in terms of uh, uh, trying to minimize these as best as possible. But the UP branch goes over here to staging as well as an MC and S branch. Uh, so there's quite a bit of switching to get done here in, uh, in Commerce City. And then this is coming through what I would say is mostly completed scenery. I'm gonna do some more cottonwood trees, uh, bring them across the, the railroad here. But uh, this is this is a siding called uh, Blackfoot at the top. Uh, again, Whitehall down here at the bottom. And then this is, uh, once the trains go into the tunnel here, this is the Soda Springs branch. This goes to Denver staging. So the train leaves the layout at this point and, uh, and goes to Denver. So. so just a couple of comments. We're at 12.50, so I think we're pretty good on time. So we'll, I'll hit these quickly and then we'll see if there's any, uh, any questions. So um, curve turnouts, Pico has those number seven, I think there's seven and seven and a half turnouts. It made all the difference to be able to lay in the yards that we have. Uh, there's never enough room to do some of this stuff once you start looking at minimums. but um, made a huge difference for me in terms of being able to fit more stuff in with, with curved leads. Um, I don't know how prototypical curved leads are, but it sure does help with the modeling. Um, a work crew is a huge help. Uh, it definitely needs to be managed. I mentioned that. Um, I do a lot more of that than I ever thought I would, but it's, it's been a, a, a huge help in terms of getting work done. So uh, with that said, it's you're constantly trying to make sure there's enough for people to do and try to help people find the stuff they're good at, stuff they like to do. Um, so anyway, it's it's been uh, it's, it's been uh, it's been great to have that help. Uh, I've mentioned the backdrops and the lighting, a lot of extra work, even just to put in that that essence, that artificial ceiling that we're putting in here, so we don't have the extension all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, but again, it helps really it directs the light. I think it really kind of finishes the the uh, the scene. Um, the pre-testing of the grades, the locos, all of that, uh, I thought that was really important. I'm glad we did it. Felt much more confident knowing that we could get a 25 car train up those grades uh, and which locomotives might spend their entire life on the NP on the level track because they just have too much uh, too much play in their gears uh, to be able to go up the hill. Uh, I mentioned the spline, uh, how, how great. You, again, you can see it here in this, this picture here with the meat at uh, uh, Troublesome. Uh, how nice it is to get those nice gradual curves as you would have going up a, a steep grade. Um, staging uh, has been great. And I get a lot of help with staging. There's a lot of trains to, to turn so everybody can see what they're doing. Um, and uh, the, the basement to me, as I take these pictures, looks really cluttered. There's not a lot of valence yet. There's not a lot of uh, currents at the bottom. We pushed really hard to get operations started. So we're at the session 12, basically. So there's gonna be a lot of redo to get the fascias on and to get things a lot more finished. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy we, in fact, some of these bill boxes are actually phone core I just put together just to get us started in terms of operations to figure out how this is gonna work. So I'm, ha I'm happy we did it. It'll be work to get everything finished, uh, especially if we're gonna do the CTC, but um, I'm um, glad we got the operation started. It's a big deal on a, on a layout this size. Um, just a couple other comments here. I, I did use a number 10 gauge bus. I'm not sure I'd do that again. Uh, it's a huge wire to get enough heat to solder onto. Uh, it also complicates if you're using the suitcase connectors, which I like to use, what kind of a strategy you use to get from 10 gauge down to 18 or 22 gauge, whatever you're using for feeders. So uh, it's, it's insurance. It gives you a lot of capacity, but I, you know, I used followed all the other rules with DCC, like the 30 foot, what, 30 foot max away from a booster, et cetera. So uh, at any rate, uh, just food for thought. Um, I have not stayed as 
organized on my wiring as I had wanted to, given the first layout. Uh, maybe there's a price to pay in the future. We'll see. Everything is running fine, and uh, I expect it to. Uh, but uh, I wish I would have been a little bit more organized. And it's a huge help if something does go wrong. Um, we've had humidity issues. I wish I would have bought a couple of uh, of uh, dials uh, or meters initially and realized just how much variety, uh, how much uh, change we had. We were going from 20% up to 50. Didn't realize that we had some track pop. So now that I have a sense of that, we can run a dehumidifier or a humidifier and, and keep things in uh, keep things uh, closer to a, a range where we don't have uh, track issues. Whoops. Um, large crew can be a two-edged sword for sure, whether you're looking for a crew to run. Um, and I'm still looking for an alternative to run a session with 10 or 12 people instead of 20. Uh, I need to come up with something feasible to do that because sometimes you just can't get that many people. Um, so a simp simple effective paperwork is critical and it's still evolving as I get feedback from everybody. Um, flexibility, I think is key. We've just changed to a two to one clock from a three to one. I did, I, I, I ran my own yard at Whitehall as a yard master. I should be able to do it in my sleep because I designed it. Uh, and I was sweating like everybody else. And it was humbling to see just how much work somebody else had to do in there. So slowing the clock down, I think is going to help us in the yards. Um, and then that reliability to me is huge. So whether it's clean track, whether it's reliable wiring, uh, if it's not reliable, you're not going to have fun. So that, that is a huge investment as well. So, and then just, uh, just thanks for the help. Uh, Pat, I've mentioned before, uh, all these folks here uh, have been pretty much regulars in terms of the, in terms of the work crew. Uh, and then again, some of these other folks I've mentioned, uh, huge help and uh, a lot of camaraderie here in, uh, in Omaha. So we're, we're glad to share each other's resources and, and time. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any, any questions or respond to any comments. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Could you restate what the height, the heights are of your bench work decks? It's about 24 inches across the yard at mineral Springs at this 54 inch height. And again, we, the, the yard lead, where you have to do a lot of switching and uncoupling and, and we use picks for all the uncoupling. So all of the logical places where people need to reach in, I've kept less than that. Some of the yard tracks uh, might be 20, past 24 inches across. Uh, but again, you're pulling those blocks of cars out to switch them. So I, I would say 24 inches is about what I've tried to stick to. On the lower level, it might go to 30, but then again, the, 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 uh, the uh, bench work at Whitehall and Piedmont are low enough that you can reach in quite a, quite a ways further because the, the bench work isn't hitting you in the armpit, it's hitting you more at the waist. One of the pictures of the staging yards has a whole bunch of uh, regular household switches in a row. And I was just wondering what those were. The row of those is actually just turning the track off and on in staging for the staging tracks. It's always good to turn off as much sound stuff as possible. Right. So I do, I did use, again, and this is another hindsight, I used a rotary switch for the Whitehall staging and actually for, for uh, Minneapolis. And it's, it's got two poles to it. So a rotary switch, you dial you dial in and use a diode matrix and the torus will all align to a particular track, but it also turns the track power on for that track. And I think in some ways that's probably a better way to do it than leaving the individual off on switches by the card packs because inevitably everybody forgets to turn their track off. That's a great idea. So, the spline, did you rip homo sort into two inch strips and then make your spline? Yeah, it's, it's basically two inch strips uh, and then you, three of them together uh, screwed through with, uh, with the drywall screws forms the, the, the core of the spline that the track sits on. And then you add that uh, you also rip homo soap with a 30, 45 degree angle, whatever, for the, for the road bed side where the ballast is and that gets screwed in so i there's a you're basically five pieces of spline across for the for the pro profile and, and how do you support it on the l girders uh every two well right this is a piece of spline right here so again this was this is one of those um 20 some supports that's cut out so basically you just uh you screw it right to the uh to the l girder jeff otto said that he leaves a lot of his free where it's, it's actually, it's loose. It's, not everyone is screwed down tight. 
to his his uh, his wood framework. Uh, most of mine are because I didn't want him to to uh, move. I did a lot of finessing to get the super elevation just right. So most of mine are screwed down. By the time you put scenery into it, it locks it down down pretty well. So um, does that does that answer the question? What are the, the I guess the other thing to mention is that you do have to figure out a way to connect the spline to the plywood. And so Pat had come up with a, a basic. Yeah, that, that was more of my question, I guess. Yeah. So um, again, I should probably show a picture of that. It's a it's a it's a bracket that allows you to screw into the sides of the spline with a piece of plywood uh, or cut that you could screw up into the bottom of the plywood. So it's a rigid connection between the spline going in this way and then screwing up into the into the plywood. So every place they change over, that's what you have to do to connect them. I'm assuming that just the flexure of the spine uh, of the spline and, and looking at where you want tangency is the way that you create your your easement. Right, right. And it's probably, you know, I don't know how close it comes to technically laying out a spiral transition on an easement. I, you know, we I've seen seen uh articles in railroad magazines where literally you end up with mathematical tables to do it but it, you can see you can see a little bit there's quite a bit of flex um uh, in this so as you flex it and then screw it in together uh you can make a fairly good curve with that homosote it's flexible enough to do it um we have a we have a curve going into the narrow gauge room that's about 24 inch radius um and if you if you use a, a form of sorts on the on the inside of the curve and screw the homosote to that plywood or that or that one by form and then just keep adding layers of homosote you can get a fairly sharp curve with it with it without it breaking if you just try to free form it you typically snap it if you try to go to a sharper curve than that so but for any of these really gradual ones like i'm pointing to here on the uh, on the this lower right uh, Again, I, we would stand back and, and we might move this uh, this piece of one by a little bit. We push the curve out a little bit, just trying to get that sense of, of what a railroad would have done to, to gradually climb the hill. And and technically, um, you know, the spiral, like you says, mathematically a mess. Uh, the way it was set up was it was easy to lay out in the field, but in a layout, um, bending a piece of material like this. Uh, and I've, I used a, an aluminum yardstick turned on edge. The curve is cubic um, right. when you do that, and that's close enough. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah certainly. Well, especially I, I, I would hesitate to guess just how how broad a radius some of these curves are. I know, I mean, Jeff Jeff had a piece of his layout that he moved from Omaha, and I think he said it was a 125 inch radius curve or something because he had measured it. It tends to give you that sense of what spiral transition would be if it was actually done. Are you doing the super elevation on top of the homosote spline or are you uh, super elevating the entire spline? Uh, doing it on top of the spline. And what I found was, um, I think a lot of folks when they do spline will use a, a belt sander with a vacuum. I didn't have one and I was a little bit leery about the, the dust on, when you cut homosote on a table saw, it's a nightmare. Right. And so Pat was 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 uh, gracious enough to actually cut it outside of his house. So there's there's nothing there's nothing better than having a work crew show up with cut spline homosote as opposed to saying here's the four by sheet right. let's go cut it in your basement. So I would level the top as best I could. I would use uh, narrow masking tape that you can buy from Uline I think is the company on and you just you just lay it out and you build up the the uh, masking tape. Some people like to use wood and, and, and styrene and other things. What I found on some curves though, if the spline was already at the accurate super elevation as we had installed it, and it might be in terms of, of horizontal deflection as it curves, then I, then I would leave it. I wouldn't flatten it and then add the super elevation. So it was really a combination of whatever we needed to get just the right amount of super elevation as the curves went back and forth. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. That was an excellent presentation. All right. Thanks.